This is APCO Forum, powered by APCO Worldwide, an advisory and advocacy communications firm. Now, here's your host, John Deftarius. Hello and welcome to APCO Forum, timely conversations catalyzing progress on global topics. I'm John Deftarius of APCO Worldwide. In this series, we'll be following the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, or the UNGA, where delegates from all over the world meet to discuss a range of topics of global importance. And in parallel, APCO is convening within the APCO Forum uh, experts and guests to engage in discussions to uncover insights that help unpack the issues at play around the world. Uh, clearly, the U.S. and China and their relations, a key issue in terms of global commerce and geopolitics, uh, the number one and number two economies in the world today. Uh, and in fact, it's fair to say it's probably the frostiest relationship we've seen between the two since the opening of China better than four decades ago. We have an expert uh, panel of uh, discussion leaders tonight. Let's bring in James Robinson, the global lead of geocommerce at uh, APCO. Uh, and I think before we get the debate going here, uh, James, let's set a framework as you see the most important issues at the UNGA, but of course, because of the power of the United States and China, what should we look forward to in 2022? How do you see it? Well, John, thanks for having us today. Um, I think any discussion of, of, of US-China, we actually need to take a step back and put China in its own context. I think for Chinese leaders that are at the UN General Assembly this week, they're going to be thinking most clearly about their own domestic policy uh, objectives. Number one, securing the legitimacy of the party. And, and, and how do they do that? A couple of ways. One, continuing to deliver economic prosperity in pursuit of, of making China a moderately prosperous society by 2049. Uh, number two, really getting China back to its a rightful position of, of being regarded as a world power and ensuring that its own red lines are being respected around issues of Taiwan and, and Hong Kong and uh, human, human rights. And then I think on the sidelines, there's a number of areas of potential collaboration, whether on climate change, COVID relief and recovery, uh, and even peace and security in Afghanistan and uh, along its western border. James, that's an excellent framework for our discussion. Let's bring in our two uh, panelists that are going to be joining us in the uh, debate here, if you will. Uh, James McGregor is chairman of Greater China for APCO, and Teresa Liu is the managing director of Global China Practice uh, for APCO. Both have great experience with China and, and also uh, within the journalistic fields, author uh, in terms of Jim's case, uh, and Teresa in the corporate sector. Uh, Jim, if I, I can, let me start with you because we often... Uh, don't talk about the international priorities for China today. This is a China has grown up economically over the last four decades. Is it willing to flex its muscles here on the geopolitical front? And that's why we see the tensions with the U.S. Or can they be smoothed over in your view? Well, you know, China has, uh, you know, is now what got to count for 15 percent of uh, world GDP. It's a top trading nation with two thirds of the world's countries. Um, and it wants to have a status that's equal to that. Um, and it's not in the G7. Um, so China China's actually looking at the West as being in disarray. And this is the time that they've got a 15-year window to kind of reorder the world order a bit so that China is back in a place that reflects its real economic and geopolitical power. So Xi Jinping is moving very fast, whether it's with the Belt and Road, with its uh, other investments around the world, uh, training um, uh, officials from other countries. And also, they want the world to accept the Communist Party and the Chinese system. Um, it's, it's very different than the, the governing system of the West. And they want to make the world safe for the Communist Party and the Chinese system. They want people to accept their system. Um, and that, that's going to be uh, um, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch. Indeed, I, I thought it was interesting, uh, Teresa, that uh, before the United Nations General Assembly, that uh, President Joe Biden spoke with President Xi Jinping, and they basically said, "We don't want our economic competition to stand in the way of bilateral relations." What did you take out of that uh, before the UNGA? I thought it kind of set a different uh, framework, if you will. Yeah, I think uh, both leaders, um, they have um, their priorities of uh, really serving the domestic audience. 
So China has been in a very critical critical time with uh, the Party Congress happening next year in October, and then Xi Jinping on one hand need to make sure the economic perform well. At the same time, he need to make sure he has enough support uh, in the country, which we can see the rising of nationalism. So I think uh, both leaders. Um, they want to address uh, issues in different ways. Um, China has been made very clear uh, what are the red lines. I think uh, President Biden has been pushing for uh, China to respond to issues like human rights, uh, like uh, territory issues. I think that's uh, something China is not going to do. So we hope that we can see um, some openings in trade, in climate change, and also in economic activities. Um, after um, both leaders are ready to uh, have further conversation. Well, I'm glad you brought up climate change. I'm wondering, in the context of COP26, which is not an easy process, as we know, uh, it's uh, stalling on some fronts here. Can this be the great unifier, uh, James, between China and the United States? Can they find common ground when it comes to uh, climate and policies and, and lead on both fronts? You know, there's some some hopeful thinking here. I think the the the, the great way to view climate change is the economic opportunity. Um, both the U.S. and China are looking for a new generation of innovation. I think there's a, a growing recognition that whoever owns the technologies of low carbon uh, economy uh, really stand to benefit their uh, domestic industries uh, in in the future. In addition to obviously Obviously, the pressing need to tackle climate change it's, it's, itself. So it may be a case of um, enlightened self-interest, both parties coming to the, 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 the table and a healthy dose of, of, of competition that actually benefits uh, all of us around the world. You know, we can only hope that it doesn't descend into, um, you know, a, a competition for um, that's going to mix in with other issues. I mean, this is what happened during the Obama administration, is that um, Obama was focused on, on, on climate change, and China would use that in negotiations to get other things from the U.S. And now with, with John Kerry uh, as a special envoy, um, you know, trying to take a separate tack on climate change, it's already looking like it's getting mixed up in the other issues. When Kerry was recently in China, he flew to Tianjin uh, to talk climate change with Chinese officials. Um, the two Chinese officials who met with him did not meet with him in person. They met with him remotely after he had flown, um, you know, all the way to Tianjin. That was not did not go down well in Washington. So I'm worried about it becoming too political. When basically, if the U.S. and China don't get it together on climate change, it's, it's suicide for the planet. Uh, it certainly is because of the, the demands that we see for energy around the world. Uh, and, and Teresa, it'd be good to have you weigh in on this because I've had uh, discussions recently in the energy sector where I spend a good time on my uh, thinking. And I'm starting to hear about multiple pathways for COP26, you know, for the developing world versus the developed. And if you don't have the number one and two economies on the same hymn sheet, if you will, it could uh, spell trouble. Uh, what are you hearing yourself in, in the context of China and the Washington apparatus? I think uh, climate change is a topic that China is very committed in terms of uh, collaborating with the international society. But I think the question here is how. So uh, whether China has the uh, right, um, like right ambition and right approach to really come up with a, a realistic roadmap. We have seen uh, the ambitious goals are there, but the action the government has been taking, whether those are realistic, uh, realistic actions and whether those actions are feasible, I think that's one question. The second question is, as Jim mentioned just now, whether the leaders, they are able to separate climate change with other issues that China deems very sensitive and red line issues of the country. Um, personally, I'm a little bit optimistic that uh, China might land on um, sort of dialogue with uh, the U.S. on climate change, but how much uh, both can, countries can achieve by having those dialogue, I think that's a big question mark in everyone's mind. Good. James, do you want to weigh in on supply chains in this kind of uh, COVID-19 recovery? Uh, we learned a lot of lessons about global supply chains, and there's 
perhaps an effort here to have Asian regional supply chains, European ones, African ones, American ones, uh, in blocks. Will this affect China? And can China avoid that conversation to say, we are reliable, it's better to be global uh, going forward. Let's not try to uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together again, if you will. You know, China's dual circulation strategy, I think, is aimed at, at doing both. China really wants to have its cake and, and eat it. It wants to be shoring up its domestic economy and improving the quality of consumption that's happening d d domestically, and improving the, the, the value that its own companies can add to the, the economy, while also continuing to serve the, the global markets. I think Western com uh, companies and many Western governments are getting wise to this. Uh, and actually, there's probably things that we could learn uh, from China here in, 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 in the US uh, and, and in, 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 in Europe. I think fundamentally, though, um, China remains a very attractive place to source from. Um, certain industries are so stitched into the economy of China, that it's very difficult to find anywhere else that you could re recreate the kind of scale and efficiency that China's managed to deliver. The multinationals, uh, whether they're European, Japanese, or American, that are in high-end manufacturing and materials, um, they're doubling down on China. They're bringing more of their supply chain into China because they, they, they um, well, because China is very welcoming of it. And with with it, uh, the Trump tariffs and COVID, um, China uh, knows it's vulnerable, uh, just like America knows it's vulnerable uh, for what you do not have on shore. And they want, and they're looking at. They feel that they're going to face a long-term hostility from um, the Western democracies. And so they are putting as much on shore as they can. And um, these companies are going along because, look, these companies are in China for China. More than 80 percent of what American companies manufacture in China is sold in China. So you got to be in that market. Hey, you know, Teresa, I wanted to ask you about the European Union and get your perspective on this. I thought it was fascinating. Um, after the U.S. election, before Joe Biden was sworn in, the European Union, led by Germany, decided to go with a free trade agreement. Uh, to secure that relationship with China, which ruffles some feathers where you are in Washington. What do you make of this U.S.-European alliance right now and the importance of China to the European Union, which is a huge market on its own? Yes, actually, um, China's uh, trade agreement with the EU, that has been the best hope of the uh, Xi administration before Biden uh, got elected. And then China actually thought uh, EU is a very liable market for the country compared to the U.S. So uh, as a Chinese, I can say um, China in general see European countries as friends rather than as competitors. But I think the reality is after uh, the Biden administration on board, China realized uh, the U.S. influence has far beyond what they have imagined. So that's why China is also in the process of trying to figure out how to manage the economic relation and also political relationship with the EU, especially now being pressed on sensitive topic of human rights issues, uh, Hong Kong issues, and also the question about uh, China's next step about Taiwan. So it will be very complicated as well, more than they expected. Right, I want to get the three of you to weigh in on Afghanistan, if you will, and kind of the messy departure by the United States. Uh, I was, you know, based in the Middle East for 10 years, and many looked at as this as a vacuum for China and Russia to fill, uh, establishing tighter relations with Iran and that sphere of influence with uh, Pakistan as well. Uh, Jim McGregor, do you want to jump in on this and how the Chinese uh, see what happened in Afghanistan and the potential opportunity out of it? Well, actually, I, I think China was quite comfortable with U.S. having a troop presence in Afghanistan because it kept things stable. Um, you know, it, it was stable. They didn't have trouble on their border, um, you know, with Xinjiang and with any kind of Uyghur separatists. Um, and now it's the, the country is very unstable and it's being led by a group of people that are, uh, let's say, they, they I think they have some primitive ways of doing things. And China's very worried about what could happen. Now, China may go in with a little bit of hubris and think, well, we can go in there and we can slosh a lot of money around it'll work but um you know uh, uh the america went in there with hubris the the uh the british went in there with hubris the russians went over there with in there with hubris so china's got to be very careful it's not it's not a good situation for them i mean i i would 
I would agree. Um, and I think China uh, is still feeling its way in how to in engage in international hotspots. And we've seen obviously a, a number of, of moves within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in Southeast Asia, uh, and they haven't always been successful. You know, the uh, terrorist bombings in Pakistan that have, have caught Chinese nationals you know, have had a big effect domestically. And I, I, I suspect, and I'd be interested in Theresa's comments on this, I suspect the Chinese people don't have a whole lot of appetite to see their blood and treasure being spent in Afghanistan um, when uh, there's plenty of domestic problems that they're expecting their, their government to, to help resolve first. Yeah, James, just one more point. I think um, uh, the Chinese people and also the Chinese government, um, before they see opportunities, because um, the U.S. hasn't done a perfect job with drawing uh, from Afghanistan, but at the same time, the Chinese government realized this issue might be too complicated. So you can see the rhetoric change from the Chinese government um, now compared to two weeks ago. So I think uh, the Chinese government, they might be more open for collaboration. And then on the issue of terrorism, uh, China has uh, pointed out in recent days that they think it's very hard for the Taliban government to cut the ties with the terror terrorists. I think that's a concern and a legitimate one that the Chinese government may seek more international collaborations. Uh, in fact, I wanted to talk to you about international institutions in this uh, environment of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, modernizing the World Trade Organization. How did the WHO respond to the global pandemic, perhaps China's influence on this? Uh, can we have much more effective collaboration, uh, which would actually be led by the U.S. and China after what we had were pretty tense relations? Let's start with James. It's a great question. I mean, the way that China has invested behind international institutions in the past five, six years is really pretty impressive. And seeing Chinese leadership at uh, the ITU and, and a number of other UN agencies, you mentioned the World Health o Organization. I think uh, the, the Biden administration is trying to uh, correct an imbalance that has, uh, has occurred. And I, I think European um, governments are wholly supportive of, of, of that. Uh, yeah, the, the problem that the U.S. Uh, faces is the, the lack of continuity. China is able to set a strategy and stick to it over the course of decades. You know, here we uh, uh, s struggle to get beyond the, the next uh, uh, election, which is never more than two years a, a, a away. So it's, I, th I think it's st still to be seen whether the U.S. can sort of reassert itself. Um, but we know China is, is, is absolutely trying to use its investments to, to sort of set standards for the next generation. I think that the whole world is going to have to face some changes because the whole Bretton Woods system that was set up after World War II is now dated. It's very dated. I mean, look at the G7. Some of those countries are smaller than Chinese provinces, um, and, and, but they have outsized influence dating for World War II. China joined all these international organizations during reform and opening because it needed to be connected to the world, but it wasn't there when the rules were made. China wants to remake the rules. It wants to remake these organizations to reflect its own power. Look, they've been very strategic. If you look at all these UN organizations and other international institutions, China has been seeding people in there for 25 years. And they went in at a low level, and now they're rising up to head up a lot of these organizations when, where from the West it's very random. Uh, China has a very strong strategy. Um, I, this is going to be very difficult. Look at the World Trade Organization. I mean, WTO, everybody agrees that it's essential and everybody agrees it doesn't work anymore. So, uh, and you got to have you got to have a global trading system. Um, you need governance of a global trading system, and we're still, uh, you know, this is a system that is not working at all. And that's been part of the reason that it doesn't work is not China's fault, but because of China joining, because China's economy is so powerful and, and it's so dominant in world trade that um, it needs to be under a governing system, as does the United States, because we saw what Donald Trump was willing to do in just ignoring these institutions. Well, it's interesting, Teresa, because uh, the U.S. is constantly saying the, that China has to live under the rules-based system. And what Jim is alluding to here is that they, they want to start establishing the rules because they're so powerful. 
So how do the two see the world eye to eye here when it comes to inter, uh, international institutions? I think for China, when they, as Jim mentioned, uh, China joined those international institutions um, 20, 20 some years ago. At that time, China wasn't part of the rulemaking process. So China didn't have the capacity to do so, and also the Chinese economy wasn't there yet. So now China see the opportunity, and then they want to particip participate more in the setting of international rules. But I think the challenge is um, capacity is one issue. On the other hand is the differences um, between China and other economies. I think that's an issue that China need to really uh, think about when they are thinking of international standard, whether it's a China standard or as an international standard might be accepted by all the developed economies. Okay, James, the last word to you. Uh, everybody's been watching what... Uh is a heavier hand domestically by China on companies like Alibaba or Didi. Uh, once they get to a certain level, it seems that China's, you know, pulling back on them. How should the international community look at these efforts here by President Xi Jinping and his uh, team? Look, I think this is a very, actually very natural thing for a, an economy that's developing to, to, to go th through. For um, uh, the, the past 10, 15 years, you've just seen exponential growth. Uh, and I think China's leaders realize that there are imbalances and, and bubbles have, uh, have occurred. And there is a genuine interest in trying to uh, better regulate and create more fairness and a better level playing field. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, some of these these tech players, but I think across the economy, we're, we're working with with companies in 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 the apparel sector and in, in technology and um, uh, 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 energy and marketing. Um, they're all seeing uh, a tightening of, of regulation, and I think uh, it, it's quite reasonable. Uh, that's certainly an issue we have to watch uh, very carefully going forward. Uh, superb analysis from the three of you. James Robinson, the global lead of geocommerce for APCO. Jim McGregor, our chairman of Greater China. And Teresa Liu, the managing director of the Global China Practice. We hope that the APCO Forum has provided greater insight of the key issues around the world today to allow organizations to become catalysts for progress in the future. You can follow us on our social media channels at APCO Worldwide. And of course, sign up for the forum on your favorite podcast platform. On behalf of APCO Worldwide and the APCO Forum, I'm John Defterian.